Good afternoon, and welcome to MEI's newly renovated historic headquarters. I'm Jerry Feierstein, Senior Vice President here at the Middle East Institute, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's book talk with MEI scholar Tom Lipman. In his new book, Crude Oil, Crude Money, Aristotle Onassis, Saudi Arabia, and the CIA, Tom tells a story of a little-known but significant event in the U.S.-Saudi relationship that combines all of the facets of a swashbuckling story of corporate intrigue, a spy thriller, and a political drama centered on the growing fractures in Saudi society and government as the Al Saud family and their inner circle coped with the death of the kingdom's founding patriarch, King Abdulaziz, and the rise of his successor, King Saud. The dispute at the heart of Tom's book and the response by the Eisenhower administration provides important insights into the nature of the U.S.-Saudi relationship and draws parallels between historic and current tensions in that relationship that are as relevant as today's headlines. Tom will sign copies of the book after the event. Thomas Lipman is an award-winning author and journalist who has written about Middle Eastern affairs and American foreign policy for more than three decades, specializing in Saudi Arabian affairs, U.S.-Saudi relations, and relations between the West and Islam. He is a former Middle East bureau chief of the Washington Post and also served as that newspaper's oil and energy reporter. Throughout the 1990s, he covered foreign policy and national security for the Post, traveling frequently to Saudi Arabia and other countries in the Middle East. In 2003, he was the principal uh, correspondent on the war in Iraq for WashingtonPost.com. Prior to his work in the Middle East, Tom covered the Vietnam War as Washington, as Washington Post bureau chief in Saigon. I'm looking forward to moderating uh, what promises to be a very important discussion and would like to engage all of you in our audience and watching the live stream of the conversation. Uh, we will be using the interactive website mintygot.com uh, to take your questions today. If you pull out your phones or laptops and enter the information you see in the screen behind me, uh, the screen behind me, um, you will have the opportunity to enter your questions uh, that I'll be able to view during your talk, and you'll also be able to view the questions that other members of the audience are asking. Uh, I will refer to the most popular questions uh, throughout my conversations with Tom. If you forgot your phone uh, you're, or you don't want to, uh, you may use the back of your handout to write down a question and pass it to the interns at the back of the room who will be able, able to enter the questions for you. So with that, uh, let me uh, welcome Tom Lipman to the podium uh, for uh, brief remarks, and then we'll have a conversation. Tom? Thank you very much, Jerry. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I will say I'm going to I have to revise my biography to take out that business about Vietnam. It just tells people how old I am. Um, I, probably everybody in this room knows that there is a very long and very complicated and intricate relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia, which has been one of the world's most improbable partnerships since it was forged during World War II and immediately thereafter. Um, you couldn't find two countries that were more polar opposites than the United States and Saudi Arabia in, let's say, 1945. This giant industrial powerhouse of world-renowned research and industries and a country that fundamentally was a still a, mostly a primitive, undeveloped society when Franklin Roosevelt met King Abdulaziz uh, in that famous meeting in the Suez Canal uh, on when Roosevelt was uh, on his way home from Yalta, you had this patrician from Harvard and a desert ruler who had sword scars on his body, and yet somehow they hit it off. And the relationship has always been as useful as it was improbable. Nevertheless, over the years, there have been many, many issues that have arisen of serious disagreements between the two countries. 
The relationship has always survived because both countries found it useful and even necessary. Many of those issues uh, would be familiar to almost anybody in this room and a lot of them to the American public at large, including, of course, the uh, Arab oil embargo and 9-11. Um, and there were others that are less well known, such as the anger of the United States government at the discovery in 1988 that Saudi Arabia had secretly acquired nuclear capable missiles from China and had them parked out of the desert manned by Chinese crews and would not let the Americans inspect them. Um, many of those issues were well publicized at the time and are well known in the books. The one that at, is at the core of this book is about a relatively unknown, hardly mentioned in the history books, dispute between the two countries that seriously threatened a permanent rupture in the relationship in 1954. I came across it several years ago when I was commissioned by a publisher in Saudi Arabia to write a biography of a gentleman named Abdullah Suleiman al Hamdan, known as the Minister of Everything, because for the entire history of the kingdom, going back even before its official founding in 1932, uh, Abdullah Suleiman had been the right hand man to King Abdulaziz and had been responsible for everything from the acquisition of weapons to managing the pilgrimage to conducting the negotiations, the price negotiations with uh, the Aramco Oil Consortium. And it was Abdullah Suleiman who signed the contract with none other than Aristotle Onassis that touched off the argument and the events that we're going to talk about today. So I won't go into them at any great length at the moment unless you want me to run through the narrative. <laughs> your, it's your uh, plan. All right, briefly. Briefly, the, uh, it, as you know, throughout the Middle East and pretty much in, in the, the world, the oil business was developed by large, international, deep-pocketed American and European oil companies that had the capital and the technology to do what the countries that had the oil couldn't do for themselves. And that's Saudi Arabia, Iraq, uh, Iran, Venezuela, Nigeria, uh, Angola, they could bring in the equipment, the trained personnel, the engineers, the transportation, uh, the chemistry to develop the oil industries. And in most of those countries, the foreign company would get a concession, which basically would split the proceeds with the host country, often on condition that the foreigners trained the locals over time so that the foreigners would work themselves out of a job. And that was pretty much the way it was. The Americans ran the oil business and Abdullah Suleiman collected the money on behalf of the king. And they were constantly re trying to renegotiate the price, of course. Um, and the Americans were, to use a more modern expression, fat, dumb, and happy, until January 1954, uh, when King Saud, two months on the throne after the death of his renowned father, authorized Abdullah Suleiman to sign a contract with none other than that renowned international brigand and playboy, Aristotle Onassis. That contract provided for Onassis to create a Saudi-registered, Saudi-flagged, and eventually Saudi-crewed tanker fleet in exchange for, but Aristotle Onassis would own the fleet, in exchange for which his fleet would have the exclusive right to transport all the oil exported from Saudi Arabia by sea which at the time included a lot of oil purchased by the United States Navy, a lot of petroleum products. This contract dropped on Aramco like a bolt from the blue. Nobody had any idea it was coming. It had been negotiated in France over the previous year by uh, largely by a gentleman named uh, Abdullah Ali Reza of the famous Ali Reza family. They were, they were, by Saudi standards, they were old money. <laughs> 
They were rich before oil. Um, and the family had the contract to operate the port of Jeddah. And Ali Reza and Onassis um, reached this deal. A great deal of cash changed hands, as you can imagine. And the king then ratified the contract. Well, you can imagine the objection of the oil companies, which used, which when they sold their oil, they sold it to um, themselves, but also to independents who wanted to make their own transportation arrangements. They would bid one fleet of tankers against the owner of another fleet of tankers to bring the rates down. This contract would have allowed Onassis to set the rates without regard to the international rate setting system. So it touched off a furor in all the great maritime nations such as Norway and the UK. The Americans were afraid that it would bankrupt Saudi Arabia because at the time there was plenty of oil. And the buyers, unhappy with the terms in Saudi Arabia, would simply go elsewhere. And the Saudis would be more dependent on the United States rather than less and would have less income. Uh, and so you ask yourself, why was it the business of the United States government to get involved? This was a contract between a foreign ruler and a foreign businessman involving a commodity in, foreign, in a foreign country being shipped mostly to foreign buyers. Why was that the business of the United States government? Briefly, and we'll go into this. This was, what, two years after the upheaval in Iran, where the Iranians had nationalized their oil and touched off a worldwide boycott that resulted in a coup in Iran and the bankruptcy of Iran as all the customers fled. The Eisenhower administration did not want a repetition of the Iranian situation in Saudi Arabia, especially because the Iranian Communist Party had been very active in the political upheaval that the coup and the changeover in Iran had created. What was the communist threat to Saudi Arabia at the time? Pretty much zero, as you all know. But that didn't prevent the Dulles brothers from seeing communists under every carpet in the souk. And so they made it their business to make sure that that contract never went into effect. And that's, that's basically the story that I told in this book. I had access to the papers of Fred Davis, who was the CEO of Aramco at the time. Um, and that was a, uh, and the family of Abdullah Suleiman gave me access to family papers when I wrote the biography of him. So I have information in here that um, you haven't had the privilege of reading elsewhere. And I hope even those of you who are steeped up to here in Saudi Arabia and oil affairs will learn something. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And <clears throat> I was afraid that you're going to give away so much of the pot that people wouldn't need to buy the book. But I think that you, <laughs> nope, that didn't work. You uh, you saved a, a few uh, a few of the tidbits for uh, for later. But uh, let me let me ask. I mean, th there were some interesting um, elements of the book that I wanted to get into a little bit. Some you touched on, some you didn't. Uh, one of the one of the things, and one of the things that was surprising to me as a, as someone who's been a, a, around that part of the world for a while, <coughs> was um, the nature of the relationship between Aramco and the Saudi government. And those of us who have served in Saudi Arabia, you know, who who heard the the tales of the 1950s, had always thought of this relationship as being this really wonderful example of how corporate America helped a friend uh, really rise up. Um, but as you said, there were tensions between the company and, and the Saudi government going back practically to the, to the very beginning. Uh, and if you could talk a little bit more about, about how you um, perceived in your research of reading Fred Davies's uh, papers, 
you know, what were what were some of the the challenges, and how did the company uh, how did the company overcome uh, some of these cultural and and historic uh, stresses in the relationship, and of course, ultimately, how did the two sides move relatively smoothly from a, uh, a time when Aramco was a wholly owned U.S. conglomerate uh, consortium? Uh, to uh, the the transition to a Saudi-owned company, on a on a day-to-day -day basis, the relationship between Aramco and Saudi Arabia would have looked perfectly tranquil to a visitor to Dahran, the company town, at any time during the years we're talking about. But as in fact, there were uh, multiple sore points. Some of them involved the price that Aramco was paying and the share that it was giving to, that was given, giving to the Saudis. Some of them involved the living conditions of the Arab workers. They could all see that the Americans lived in these air conditioned houses and swimming pools and, and they lived in palm, palm frond roofed huts known as Barastis. They could all see that. Some of the issues involved the pace and the sincerity with which the Americans were fulfilling or not fulfilling their contractual obligation to train Saudis in operations and management so that they could eventually take over. And this is, this is long before OPEC. But the Saudis could also see that the oil uh, host, the host countries elsewhere, were getting more money and a better deal for their oil than they were, especially Venezuela. And so there were more or less constant haggling over how much the Americans would pay, uh, who would be responsible for training the Saudis, how the Saudis would live. And it would, and I don't, I don't mean to suggest that the Americans weren't responsive. They just didn't understand how the Saudi people worked and how things work. I, mean, I, I don't go into this in the book, but there was a famous episode in which the Americans decided to help their Saudi workers by setting up a free lunch program in which the Saudi workers could go in and get served lunch, contents determined by the Americans, and eat off trays. And the Saudis did not regard it as a benefit, they regarded it as an insult, as the Americans would have known if they had paid attention to what was coming out of their Arab Affairs Department, right? right? And so, yes, the arrangement suited both sides, and to the ordinary workers who lived in Dahran and went to work every day as whether they were bookkeepers or oil field technicians, they, they were substantially unaware of it. But at the top, the relationship was sometimes very tense. And for Abdullah Suleiman, uh, he essentially was in a constant battle to prove his worth to the ruling family, and especially to Prince Faisal, right, by showing the Americans who was boss. Right, and, and of course, one other aspect of, of this, and, and which actually touched on the, on the Saudi um, Aramco relationship, were these stresses and strains within the, the family after Abdulaziz died. Uh, and uh, you, you mentioned uh, Abdullah Suleiman's interest in uh, ensuring that he had a good relationship with Faisal, who was the crown prince at the time. And there was obviously, there was friction between Faisal and Saud that got resolved a few years after this uh, series of incidents. Uh, but but the, one other element of the, of the book that you touch on that's extremely important is the evolution of Saudi society and government from a point where Abdullah Suleiman with Abdulaziz could be the minister of everything and basically uh, hold all of the strings of Saudi governance in his hand to a point where obviously Saudi Arabia is becoming a more sophisticated country. Uh, the ability of a single individual to control all of those elements of governance was no longer there. And how the Saudis managed 
this transition and of course how it touched on their relations, their understanding of of their responsibilities as a partner to Aramco, uh, issues related to the legal constraints that, that uh, they confronted. Well, remember that um, even up to the time King Abdulaziz died, late 1953, Saudi Arabia was a country that had no paper currency, let alone checking accounts, right? Aramco paid its workers by driving truckloads of coins out to the workstations and paying them in various kinds of coins, including Maria Theresa Taylor's and uh, Saudi gold coins and Indian rupees. I mean, and the person who managed that treasury was Abdullah Suleiman. Shortly before his death, partly at the urging of the Americans, King Abdulaziz decided that Saudi Arabia was entering a new era in which you couldn't run this country the size of Western Europe the way a single sheikh had run his tribe for all the years before the modern world came to Saudi Arabia. You needed to establish the mechanisms of some kind of government such as they had in other countries. And so before, just before his death, he ordered the creation of a council of ministers or cabinet of which there would be half a dozen or seven members or so. And he designated Saud, his oldest son, as his successor. And it's no insight on my part, it's not exactly a novel idea that the designation of a successor was Abdulaziz's greatest mistake because Saud was a well-intentioned but incompetent bungler. And so his accession to the throne touched off what became a really debilitating power struggle between him and Prince Faisal that really cost the country a decade of development. But in any case, once the Council of Ministers was created, it was clear that the days when Abdullah Suleiman was, as they said, the minister of everything, had come to an end, and he didn't have the personal relationship with the new king that he had had with the old one. And the Onassis contract really was sort of his last way of reaffirming his own essentiality. Um, it didn't work um, because it, like some of the previous contracts he had negotiated, it blew up in their faces in various ways. Remember that Saudi Arabia got rich, or was getting rich, before it had any ability to manage the money. The Saudis were to, and, and they, it wasn't like today when everybody in the Saudi cabinet has a PhD from the University of Michigan, you know. It, it, they were sitting ducks for entrepreneurial freebooters from all over the world so that they didn't know the difference really between Bechtel and, you know, fly-by-night R Us over here. And they got fleeced on some contracts. Mm -hmm. And the, Faisal held Abdullah, Abdullah Suleiman responsible because he was the one who brought those contracts in so that the country was sort of purging itself of its past and lurching into the future. At the same time, you had this internal transition in the ruling family. Right. And of course, um, speaking of freebooters, uh, another aspect of your book that, uh, that really uh, is quite fascinating and, and uh, one of those historic uh, um, uh, kind of, uh, of facts that, that many of us might have remembered from our youth, but, uh, but maybe not so much today, is this whole issue of the Greek uh, shipping tycoons, uh, Stavros Niarchos, and of course, one of the, uh, the key actors in this book, Aristotle Onassis, uh, who many people remember as the husband, uh, second husband of Jackie Kennedy, but, uh, but also had a career before that as a, as a shipping tycoon. And a little bit about, about how they um, got involved with the Middle East, uh, the uh, the intense conflict between Onassis uh, 
and his competitors in the Greek shipping industry, and, and that whole aspect of, of how one moved um, oil from, from, uh, from the Middle East to markets in Europe and the West. Well, here we go directly from the Financial Times to the tabloids. In, in terms of talking about the Greeks, particularly Onassis. Um, briefly, for those of you, well, a lot of people in this room can actually remember Aristotle Onassis, I suppose. But he, the, the people collectively referred to as Greek shipping tycoons were sort of the dot-com billionaires of their day, right? They had vast amounts of money, and they were involved in all kinds of businesses and controlled vast fleets that moved the commerce of the world. Um, Onassis had fled what is now Smyrna when the Turks retook it after World War I and basically set out to purge it through massacre if necessary of its Greek population. And he fled to Argentina where he first made money in the tobacco business partly by um, dousing the tobacco with salt water and claiming the insurance money, which was easier than actually selling the tobacco. I found that out from the FBI files on him. Um, and he gradually got into the shipping business like many other Greeks. Um, and like any other ruling family, they had really, really intense internal conflicts. Onassis's biggest rival, was his brother-in-law, hmm. another Greek shipping tycoon named Stavros Nyarkos. Nyarkos's name can be found on a public library branch on Fifth Avenue in New York and in a room at the Museum of Modern Art endowed by his foundation, even now. Um, so whatever, they spent their lives outdoing each other on this, that, money, women, yachts, whatever. So when Nyark and they, they basically detested each other. So back up to how this came about. In the early 1950s, there was a small time Greek shipping operator, um, went to Baghdad in pursuit of a business deal. And he worked out a thing with the Iraqis similar to the arrangement that the that Onassis later did with Saudi Arabia. You guys are shipping all this oil on other people's ships. Why don't you ship it on your own ships? And I can help you do that. Nothing ever came of that because guess what? There was a coup in Iraq and the new government wasn't part of it. But the idea was in play now. So all these Greeks hung, hanging around in the same watery holes on the Mediterranean knew each other. And this guy sold the idea to Onassis who authorized him to negotiate with the Saudis. Well, he didn't know any Saudis, but he knew somebody who did. Um, I mean, he, and he got to a gentleman named Abdullah Ali Reza. And Ali Reza also spent his time on the Mediterranean and undertook to arrange this contract for Onassis in exchange for a substantial payment and for a retainer that he would earn monthly as Onassis' agent in the kingdom. Now, parenthetically, was that bribery? Was that corrupt? Well, by our standards, it would be today. But in those days, that's the way business was done in Saudi Arabia. If you accompanied the ruler or the Ghazi on a raid, you got a share of the spoils. If you brokered a deal, you got the finder's fee. That's the way you made your money. The king never saw it as bribery. And so Ali Reza negotiated this, um, this contract. Yeah. Unfortunately for um, Onassis and Ali Reza, the, um, the middleman, believe it or not, I'm sitting here, I can't remember the name of the middleman. I wrote whole chapters about him about this book, right? <laughs> Um, the Catapotus? Yeah, Catapotus, right. Yeah. The middleman, Catapotus, was supposed to get a substantial finder's fee, right? And Onassis stiffed him. Right? That upset the gentleman. Right? 
And so he began providing information to Onassis's opponents, including, of course, Stavros Nyarkos, right, whose pockets were almost as deep as Onassis's, and set out to tr do what he could to undo the deal. Remember, they were married to sisters, right, at the time. Later on, both split from their wives, and Nyarkos married Onassis's sister, sister wife, after shedding his own. But that, that was before he married Charlotte Ford. Um, so, you know, trying to sort this out was almost as difficult as sorting out the internal Saudi politics. Uh, and Nyarkos had contacts in Washington, many of which were um, employed at the time by an outfit known as the Central Intelligence Agency. And so they jointly were sort of on the case. In July of 1954, there was a meeting of the National Security Council at the White House at which Eisenhower presided. And this was six months after the contract had been signed and after everybody had finally seen it and knew what was in it and knew who all the players were, which took months. And they approved a national security policy document for the Middle East, which Eisenhower signed off on. The wide tour d'horizon of the situation in the Middle East, where things were promising, where things looked troublesome, where there were threats from the communists, right? What to do about it, what American policy should be. The only person mentioned by name in that document was Aristotle Onassis, <laughs> because one of the policy, one of the action items approved by the president that day was to make sure that the Onassis contract never went into effect because of it, what they saw as its troublemaking potential. And so now the CIA had a new mission and was getting information from Nyarkos, um, but the CIA also wanted to deploy its own agent to work on this. Here was part of the government's problem, of the US and United States government's problem. <coughs> The United States government, like Aramco, wanted to undo this contract and put the Saudis back on the straight and narrow. But nobody wanted to be perceived as bullying or giving orders to the king because, I'm gonna get my notes back off the <laughs> lectern here. They didn't wanna be perceived as bullying the king because despite the apparent inequality of a struggle between the United States and Saudi Arabia in 1954, the Saudis were not without leverage. They had, first of all, the lease, the Americans were operating a strategic air base at Dahran that Abdulaziz had given them permission to create. Um, and the lease on that was going to expire the following year. Well, you want the lease extended? Right? Don't push me around. Right? Second, um, the king had the power, ultimately, to revoke the American concession in its entirety and give it to BP or Total or some other company. The Americans certainly didn't want that to happen. And then, in the midst of all this, and all the diplomatic discussions, the Saudis let it be known that the king had received an invitation from the Soviet Union to reestablish diplomatic relations, which had been broken in 1938, and had been invited to Red China, right? Well, you know, there's a reason why people let information like that get out. Right? It delivers the message that you want to deliver. There was no chance whatsoever that the Saudis were going to succumb to the blandishments of Moscow or Beijing. They were rigorously anti-communist for a lot of reasons. Nevertheless, just putting that out there set off the Dulles brothers. So the Saudis were not in a position to be pushed around. So the idea now was to get rid of that contract, get the king to do what you wanted, and leave no fingerprints.
So we have a question from from the floor. Um, to to speculate for a moment, what do you think would have been the result if, in fact, the Onassis deal had gone through? How would that have affected U.S. relations with Saudi Arabia? And how do you, you know, just playing it out for a little bit, what do you think um, the repercussions would have been if, as, as you say at the, you know, towards the end of the book, I mean, it was actually um, a close run thing. It was not, you know, even though Aramco thought it was, a, it was an open and shut case, turned out that it was actually a little bit more complicated than that. So if, in fact, uh, the Saudis had uh, come out and, and uh, been able to implement that contract, what do you think would have happened with well, the U.S.? Well, based on what we've seen in the 60 years of ups and downs in this relationship ever since, I think eventually if the Saudis had gone ahead with it, um, the Ameri there would have been uh, upheaval in the shipping business and the Americans would have found a way to keep the strategic relationship intact. Um, just as the Americans did that, every other time the Saudis did something that deep displeased the United States, whether you're talking about assassinating Jamal Khashoggi or stiffing the Sadat Peace Initiative, right? Because the relationship was strategically and economically useful, the Saudis actually had a lot of leeway and the Americans had to decide to what extent to throw their weight around. And remember that at this, at this point in 1954, there were several other points of friction between the United States and Saudi Arabia already in play. Um, the United States, for example, had taken a neutral position in a really nasty dispute between Saudi Arabia and Britain over a piece of land known as the Boremi Oasis, which both countries claimed, and the Saudi, Aram, with Aramco's help, the Saudis had sent troops in there, and the British, the Brits chased out the Saudi troops and canceled an arbitration proceeding, and Dulles didn't want to pick between friends, so he didn't, and the Saudis didn't appreciate that. Um, there were constant arguments between Riyadh, well, between actually Jeddah in those days and Washington about what weapons the Saudis could acquire and whether the Saudis would have to pay for them, and if so, how much, and the oil price issue, and even the implementation of Truman's 0.4 uh, technical assistance program, which the Saudis canceled in 1954 because their nose were out of joint about it. So the Americans could see on several fronts that the Saudis might be sort of drifting dangerously, if not toward the Reds, at least away from them. And then as now, Saudi Arabia was an important pillar of American policy in the region. Um, and so I think what would have happened is that the oil companies would have sucked it up, and indeed the Saudi oil sales might have gone down, but it wouldn't be the oil company's problem because what were they going to, they going to do? Yeah. Right? Um, and, you know, go to Germany, right? Uh, and the Americans would have let it happen because they would have had to let it happen. And this has been the pattern in this relationship going back to 1948, the first really big dispute when the United States was the first country to recognize Israel. Other Arab leaders, led by Shukri al Kuwaitli of Syria, insisted that Abdulaziz cancel the American concession over that. And Ab Abdulaziz basically said, easy for you to say, my brother, this is all I have. And he didn't do it, right? And there's a long list here. I mean, during the oil embargo, which lasted six months, some of you remember those gas lines, right? Uh, Henry Kissinger was denouncing the Arabs as savages. You know, you can buy transcripts of Kissinger's phone calls. They'll send them to you on a CD. I mean, it's, it's, it's just amazing uh, to hear what he, was, what he said in real life. You know, anyway, you don't, you, don't get the, you don't get the accent when you read the transcripts, <laughs> but savages. I mean, really? Um, and then you had the, uh, 
the SS-20 missiles. Um, in 1992, many of you may know Ambassador Chaz Freeman, who was ambassador to Saudi Arabia during Desert Storm. Get Freeman, Ambassador Freeman to tell you what it was like to go around Saudi Arabia with his begging bowl to get the Saudis to pony up $16 billion to cover the cost of Operation Desert Storm. Darn near broke the country. Saudi Arabia had to go into the, into the money markets to borrow money. Um, and, you know, the Saudis opposed the U.S. invasion of Iraq. So there were a lot of issues. But look what happened when we, just, when we the Americans, discovered those Chinese nuclear-capable missiles. The Americans were furious. Um, the State Department sent a senior person to tell the Saudis, basically, congratulations, you just moved yourself to the top of Israel's target list. The outcome was that we, the United States, let the Saudis keep the missiles without any further recriminations, provided that Saudi Arabia sign on to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which it had previously refused to do until the Israelis did it, which the Israelis have never done. So Saudi Arabia is nice to this day, a party to the NPT. They always found some way to work it out because it was useful, if not essential, to both sides. Whether that is true today is the subject of a whole separate discussion. Right, and, and uh, of course, again, I, I think that uh, interest in the audience, I mean, you know, because today is the first anniversary of the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. And, and the question is, you know, how does, how does that fit into what you, uh, what you rightly describe as a, a pattern of, of crisis and, and resolution that goes back in the relationship to the, to the uh, very origins of it? Um, you know, is the Khashoggi murder different? Uh, or do you expect that somehow the U.S. will be able to, at some point, figure out how to accommodate this and how to move on? I think that's already happening. And my first exhibit would be the guest list at the forthcoming investment conference in Riyadh. A lot of people who got up on their righteous high horse and decided not to go a year ago after the Khashoggi killing are going back this year because that's where the money is. And so I, I think what's likely to happen is that it'll be like the 19th year of Nelson Mandela's imprisonment. You know, I mean, yeah, it's really too bad. But meanwhile, and I, that's what I think is going to happen. I'm not proud of it. But there's another thing to consider. During these years, during, during all these years, you had people like King Faisal and Jim Baker working on these issues. You had people of knowledge, vision, sagacity, right? And, and disciplined temperament working on these issues. I, I would challenge you to identify the roster of people who fall into that category in these two countries today. Hmm. Right, and and the other thing, and, and again, I you know I, I think that there's some interest in the audience. I mean, the the other issue is there there is a conceit in the United States today that in fact Saudi Arabia is no longer that important for the United States. I mean, you hear it from the president himself, even though he's got this very close relationship with Mohammed bin Salman. But, you know, this whole idea that, well, after all, we're energy independent, which is not true. Um, and we're not, uh, you know, concerned about what happens, uh, that what happens in the Gulf on oil doesn't affect us, also not true. Uh, but but there is this theme in in American society and government today that, in fact, we can discard with this relationship because the Saudis don't actually do anything for us. Well, the question of what the Saudis do for us. A, a couple of years ago, I was part of a group assembled by professors at George Washington University to address this very question, right? Why do we need to have, what is it, 50,000 troops in the Gulf? The United States has troops from Inchilik 
to Diego Garcia, right, all across the Gulf. What exactly is their mission, right? Why are they there? And if their mission is to defend Saudi Arabia against attacks from outside, I think they need to um, do a few war games and um, burnish their tactics, if not their strategy, right? Um, but we, we concluded that the oil itself from Iraq, Iran, Kuwait, all the countries over there, the United States is not independent of that oil, even though we're now again exporting crude oil. Because countries such as Germany and Japan are fundamental to our economic well-being because of the way the world is integrated, because of the in integration of the global economy. And if you had a worldwide catastrophic recession caused by a shortage of energy, you think John Smith and Mary Jones out there would not be affected by that? Of course they would. And I think it's pretty simple. Right? It's not just about price. I mean, my wife is tired of hearing me say this, so don't roll your eyes. But <laughs> look, it's not about price. Gasoline is cheaper than milk. Okay, per gallon. It's ridiculous how little we pay for gasoline. So I'm not worried about that. But the sheer availability of the fuel of all aircraft, all navigation, basically all navigation, there's no, we don't have nuclear powered container ships, right? right? Um, and transportation. I, I think people who think we're energy independent uh, think there's a wall around not only the southern border, but Canada and both coasts, because right? we're not. Right, right, and not going to be anytime soon. So, um, you know, so, so with Khashoggi, I, I agree with you that, that um, eventually uh, there will be some um, reconcilings, there will be some, some um, way of, of figuring it out. But, but I, I guess the, the question is, you know, we, we've had, as you said, we've had this series of, of shocks going back and, uh, you know, to, to the very beginning. And one of the ones that you talk about a little bit in the book uh, that you didn't mention is Suez Canal. But the other part of it is that the United States at critical moments has been able to demonstrate to the Saudis the importance of the relationship. So the Suez Canal was one example where, where clearly uh, the Saudis were gratified by President Eisenhower's response to um, the, uh, the, the British the, the French. Suez, uh, Suez, the British, the tripartite uh, invasion in yeah, 1956, uh, right? Um, and so uh, uh, you quote a very warm note that, uh, uh, that uh, King Saud sent to the president after that. Uh, grateful. A few years later, of course, we had the uh, Republic. And the interesting thing in the 1950s was that the Saudis still had a reasonable relationship with Gamal Abdel Nasser. That changed. And in the early 1960s, uh, the Saudis and the Egyptians were at each other's throats in Yemen um, because, uh, because the Saudis had decided that Nasser was a greater threat uh, to their stability than the Shia were. Um, and uh, the U.S. was an important uh, partner for the Saudis in, in that event. And then, of course, you fast forward to 1991 uh, and, uh, and the, the first Gulf War and the invasion of Kuwait. So, so there have been moments, and I, I think you could probably also throw in 1979, um, the Iranian Revolution, but also the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. So there have been... While there have been these, these uh, periodic crises in the relationship, there have also been periodic moments where the importance of the relationship has been clear to both parties uh, and that we have been able to, to recognize the, the essential nature of that uh, bilateral relationship. Well, let me, let, me, let me go back to Suez for a minute, mm -hmm. just because Suez becomes actually an important element in this book, right? One of the things that happened, this wasn't about machinations by the CIA or its agents or even by Nyarkos. One thing that happened as a result, as word about the Onassis contract filtered out, 
into the trade press mostly, was that oil buyers worldwide um, boycotted Onassis's fleet. As their charters expired, they refused to renew them. They signed up with other shippers, other ship operators. And so the result was that by the spring of 1956, Onassis was in desperate economic shape because his fleet was largely idle. And who came to his rescue? None other than Gamal Abdel Nasser by nationalizing the Suez Canal and precipitating the Suez War of 1956. So when that war, the war closed the canal. Other than Nasser, the biggest beneficiary was Aristotle Onassis, because all of a sudden, all that Gulf oil had to go all the way around Africa to get to Europe and the United States. Huge demand for tankers. And who had the available fleet of idle tankers? Aristotle Onassis. And suddenly, principle took a few months off, right? <laughs> as it often does in these situations, right? We shouldn't be surprised by that. Um, so the, um, the closing of the Suez Canal, I, let, me, let me just divert for a minute. Right? All through this episode, the Saudi government was the, wasn't the only one that had its internal disagreements. We had serious policy issues here in the United States. For example, after the worldwide boycott of Iranian oil, when the Shah had been restored to the throne, and I'm not going to get into the details of how that happened, but <laughs> when the Shah had been restored to the throne, we, the United States, wanted to rebuild the economic strength of Iran because the Shah was our guy. And that meant finding people to operate the Iranian oil business. And so the State Department was trying to put together a consortium of big international oil companies, similar to the one in Saudi Arabia, big American oil companies, to take over the operation of the Iranian oil industry. Well, fine, that makes sense. Except at the very same time, the Justice Department was suing them in a major antitrust case. Right? And the people in the Middle East were understandably scratching their heads, saying, well, wait a minute. Are these the good guys you want to operate our oil industry, or are they the pirates and brigands that you're describing in this antitrust case? That's just one example of the policy. And, oh, and then, talk about things happening out of the blue, in the fall of 1954, while all this was going on about Saudi Arabia, the Peruvians, the Peruvian Navy seized five vessels of Onassis's whaling fleet. Yes, in addition to all his other admirable characteristics, Onassis was a huge operator of commercial whaling ships. Okay, so you can, and I, I was unable to resist the temptation to put this in the book. Not only was he not ashamed of it, he flaunted it. When Greta Garbo visited him on his yacht, he made a point of telling her that the bar stools were upholstered in whale foreskin. Anyway, back to the Peruvians. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is that why she's wanted to be alone? <laughs> <laughs> the Peruvians, Peru, Ecuador, and Chile announced the creation of a offshore limit. I think it was 250 miles. Well, we, the United States government, of course, did not recognize that offshore limit, nor did other governments. Until the Royal Sea Treaty. So Onass when Onassis' whaling ships when inside the 250 mile limit, the Peruvians seized the ships to enforce their new limit. That put us, the United States, in the strange position of being on Onassis's side in the dispute with the Peruvians at the same time we were trying to decapitate him in his dealings with Saudi Arabia, right? Uh, and so you had the Next chapter, or previous chapter. A month before 
the signing of the contract, the oil contract with Saudi Arabia, Onassis was indicted by a federal grand jury here in Washington on charges of defrauding the Navy in the purchase of surplus ships after World War II. And the indictment was kept secret until such time as Onassis showed up in the United States and could be arrested, which duly happened just about the time Abdullah Ali Reza and um, Suleiman Hamdan, so Abdullah Suleiman, were finalizing the contract. Right? Onassis was having a lunch at a high end restaurant in New York, and he was arrested by the FBI on charges in pursuant to that indictment. So now you had another dispute, really, between the State Department and the Justice Department over whether that indictment could be used as leverage in putting, in trying to get Onassis to back off from Saudi Arabia, right? And so you can understand that by the time this issue got to Eisenhower's desk, the volume of paper had reached epic proportions and there were serious internal disputes within the United States government. One of the first things that happened was the State Department sent a message to our ambassador in Saudi Arabia asking the king to omit the Navy from the requirement that the fuel be transported in the ships of, of Onassis's fleet. And the king agreed, like that. So the Navy got backed off from its participation in all this discussion. And so all this, of course, was imperceptible to the public, as were the machinations in Saudi Arabia. They became an important part of the story. And then there's a the question uh, from the floor. Uh, do you think that all of these things contributed to the um, overthrow of Saud uh, a few years later, or was that uh, separate? I think they were part of it. It wasn't this specifically. Um, Faisal could see that Saud was mismanaging the country. And I haven't gone into the history of that, but you can read uh, Joe Kashijian's biography of Faisal or many other, many other books that will go into it in great detail. Um, and it was an accumulation of things. At one time, uh, the king agreed to make um, Faisal his prime minister, and then he went back on that, and Faisal went to Europe and sulked for a couple of years. He was out of the government, and then he came back. Um, and so by the time they finally forced the king into exile, forced the king to abdicate, um, I think this would have been a substantial chapter in a long book. Okay. Okay. Fast forwarding um, again, I think uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of interest in your thoughts. Of course, um, we have the Vision 2030 uh, proposal. Uh, program, a lot of it uh, predicated on this idea that there's going to be this Aramco IPO. Uh, knowing uh, what you know about the, you know, the long and kind of murky history of Aramco, uh, do, you, do you think that there can be a successful IPO for that company? And how do you see, uh, how do you see the, uh, the 2030 project playing out? I hate talking to audiences who know more about stuff than I do. So, Herman, would you leave the room for a few minutes, please? <laughs> um, in my not particularly deeply informed view, there'll never be a successful IPO of Aramco on any regulated stock exchange in the industrialized world. Not New York, not London, not Tokyo, not Hong Kong, because they will never meet the transparency and information requirements required to float a stock in the public marketplace. I just, I don't care how many investment banks get in on this. I've heard several people suggest that the more likely outcome is a brokered sale to the Chinese. Hmm. You might get just as much capital in your hands that way, if the Chinese still have as much capital as they seem to, um, without, I mean, are you going to list what Aramco does with the money, i.e. which prince gets what? I don't think so. Yeah. That's why I don't think it's going to happen. 
the Chinese actually made the offer, right, uh, to buy 5%. Um, and I think the sticking point was their insistence that the, uh, that the price be paid in yuan as opposed to dollars. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's going to be something. I mean, I, I, but to tell you the truth, it, 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 the Saudis have created the, the, the story around, okay, if we can't do that, we'll have the investment fund buy half of Sabic or something. They, they seem to be taking money out of one pocket and putting it in the other. I, I don't quite understand what they're up to here. Uh, but if you want, I mean, when they announced Vision 2030, nobody laughed harder than I did. Because in one of my previous books, you can read about the time they introduced Saudi Arabia in 2020, right? Mm -hmm. Under the previous king, in a previous planning ministry. And what was it going to be? They're going to diversify the economy, right? Please. It's just like this latest one. Maybe, maybe some of you have seen the stories about how they're going to issue tourist visas. They did it 10 years ago. My wife and I went to Saudi Arabia on a cruise. <laughs> So, I mean, they sell old wine in new bottles all the time. And you just can't, you, you can't take any of it at face value. You know, I, I mean, one of the major, again, one of the major sub-themes of, of the book is this whole issue. And, and you touched on it in, in your earlier comments. I mean, this whole idea that the idea of paying commissions long, you know, long established, uh, in not only in Saudi Arabia, but throughout the Middle East. I mean, this idea that, that this is all a way of doing business there. Otherwise, you know, in most parts of the world considered to be corrupt, uh, corrupt practice. You know, selling your uh, influence using uh, other things. Uh, this was a major part of the, the whole story about uh, uh, the Onassis uh, plan with the Ali Rezas and, and Abdullah Suleiman and, and others. Uh, you have now a, uh, a situation where, you know, the, the crown prince says that he is uh, against corruption. It seems that he's mostly against corruption by, by people he doesn't like. Uh, but um, do, you see, do you see Saudi society evolving? Is it becoming more conscious about, about the need to address some of these issues? Or do you just think that this is going to be business as usual? Well, as far as I can tell, it's, it's been a couple of years now since I was in Saudi Arabia. Um, I, I mean, I was there between 2002 and 2013 or 14. I was there every year but one, at least for a while. But it's been a couple of years now. So I'm well aware of the changes in Saudi Arabia in terms of social activities and restraints. What I don't know is, I, let, me, let me back up a second. I never use the word reform in connection with Saudi Arabia. Reform implies improvement, and I don't believe it's up to us to decide what is an improvement in somebody else's society. I mean, the Saudis don't have mass shootings in schools, and they don't have fentanyl overdoses, and I don't think we ought to be talking to them about improving their society. So I never use the word reform. Um, but I don't know if you go to get a contract in Saudi Arabia today, whether to sell a weapons system or to sell communications technology or whatever it may be, right? Um, I don't know whether off the books money changes hands. I, I happened to be in Saudi Arabia when the United States passed the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, mm. right? And the French laughed all the way to the bank because they thought we were naive and it was self-defeating. But I think it's actually served us pretty well. Um, what, how the Saudis get around that and what they actually do, I don't have a sense because I don't know to what extent Mohammed bin Salman has the scope of knowledge and technical capacity to manage all these issues. He has so concentrated power in himself that it's almost as if they'd reverted to the days when you had a minister of everything. Um, and we were talking before we began this session, my, my, the latest, most recent example, 
was last week or the week before when suddenly he appointed his older half-brother, Abdulaziz bin Salman, to be the oil minister, right? I mean, Abdulaziz bin Salman is one of those older brothers whom a lot of us look to when Abdullah died as, you know, be, be designated crown prince and make logical sense. He'd been there, he'd been the royal man in the oil industry for a generation, right? And he was sent totally to Coventry, only to reappear two weeks ago. What that represented in terms of managing the money, of modernizing the administrative practices, um, I, I, I really, I, I can't speak to that at this stage. I would very much like to have this confirmation, this conversation with John Abizade, mm -hmm. right? Who's been remarkably unheard from since he became ambassador. Right? Well, that's probably why we said. <laughs> <laughs> right? um, remember that even if you go back to 1954, at the time that cabinet was appointed, they were what we used to call in the politically incorrect days, chiefs with no Indians, okay? There was no bureaucratic structure in Saudi Arabia. There was no deputy assistant secretary who had any kind of signing authority. They, they didn't have any of that. The, the law was what the sheikh said it was. Right? And it was many years before they got around that. Um, a month, two months before he resigned from the presidency, Richard Nixon went to Saudi Arabia, became the first American president to go there, and got what you might call a royal welcome. And one of the consequences of that visit was the establishment of the joint, the Saudi Arabia-U.S. Joint Economic Commission, which was run out of the Treasury Department. Mm -hmm. and. The purpose of the Joint Economic Commission was to show and demonstrate to the Saudis how to create and manage and run a government bureaucracy. And from 1954 until the, until the Clinton administration, we had hundreds upon hundreds of US, civil, US government civil servants from the Commerce Department, the Postal Service, from Customs, whatever, seconded into their counterpart offices in Saudi Arabia to show them how to do things, how to calculate a consumer price index, uh, how to collect customs duties. How to run a census. Yeah, yeah. We how need to, those people back. How to run a census, right. <laughs> um, and so whether today, and, and a lot, frankly, a lot of government departments came out of that in Saudi Arabia operating with reasonable competence, I thought, mm -hmm. in, in my experience with them. You know, they, they run a pretty good airport yep. in, in, in Saudi Arabia, just, just as an example, right? Um, but where they are in terms of the, of, on issues such as the corruption system and taking care of your friends and actually having open bidding on contracts, I, I, I don't know. So, uh, you know, we, we have a question. I mean, this is, I, this is, and, and I think that this is a, you know, a very interesting kind of, of way of looking at your book and, and trying to understand present day Saudi Arabia. And that is, you know, so, so Saudi Arabia since the 1930s has been dependent on the oil economy. That's been their source of revenue. You have Vision 2030, which talks about economic diversification uh, and uh, kind of predicated on this idea that the oil economy isn't going to last forever, that the society has to evolve past, uh, past that. There are questions, I think, legitimate questions about how well the implementation of 2030 is going. You know, are they making the kinds of adjustments? You talked about the tourism industry, which is a big part of 2030. Um, other elements of, of 2030 seem to be, some seem to be going better, some seems to be uh, going not so well. And so the question again is, you know, is Saudi Arabia going to be able to move past the oil economy? If, if it's not going to be able to go past the oil economy, the other reality is that the world is changing. Uh, the, the growth in energy now is in renewables, if 
if uh, uh, Herman doesn't disagree, um, uh, and and that uh, that the oil economy in, in every day is looking more and more um, as though it's going to pass from the scene. So what what happens with Saudi Arabia in that case? Look, they have. They have the same kind of internal policy conflicts that any other country does. Let me give you my favorite example. Dairy farming is an enormous business in Saudi Arabia, right? The world's biggest integrated dairy farm is in Al-Kharj, about 60 miles southeast of uh, Riyadh, right? Okay, two things. How much water does it take to hose down 100,000 cows, right? And where are they gonna get that water? I mean, it, it, that can't be a part of the future, right? But even short term, a lot of the dairy output, yogurt, ice cream, milk, was exported to Qatar, mm -hmm. right? Their biggest customer. Guess what? The amount now exported to Qatar is zero. I fail to see how that contributes to diversification of the economy into new products and new markets but it meets some other presumed policy purpose, which is imperceptible to me, um, on the part of somebody else. So I don't know anybody who thinks that the GPO and employment projections for 2030 are reasonable or uh, realistic or feasible. Um, not to say that they shouldn't actually try. Right. I was there one time not so long ago when the Deputy Minister of Labor told me that they had appointed a committee of various people to expand uh, employment opportunities for women. And one of the things the committee was supposed to do was designate what kinds of jobs it would be suitable for women to have i.e. you're not going to see them scaling utility poles, okay? But they don't have to just be teachers and nurses. They can do other things, right? Well, all the members of that committee were men. So you can argue, you know, that it's three steps forward and two steps back all the time. And the gains that women have made are have to be measured in the context, the, or that anybody has made, have to be measured in the context of Saudi society. I mean, I think it's a canard. It's really not true that the Saudis don't want to work. You know, one of the issues is there's not enough jobs for the Saudis who do want to work. And I was shocked a few years ago when I checked into the same hotel I always stay at in Riyadh, and there was a Saudi man working in the reception desk. I'd never seen that. Um, when Adel Fakir became Minister of Labor, he made a matter of policy, something that he had done at the chain of supermarkets his company owned. He opened up the job of supermarket checkout or checkout clerk to women. You women don't live in a society in which you would consider it an opportunity, a breakthrough opportunity to be a checker in a supermarket, right? But in the Saudi context, that was a big deal. They couldn't check out single men, by the way, but families right. and other women, right? Uh, and so I don't even know how to measure some of the things we're talking about. The, the, the gross statistics of GDP and, and I think you, you, you know as well as I do that Saudi statistics are notoriously unreliable. Mm -hmm. um, but even if they're accurate, they don't tell you what's happening on the ground. So last question, maybe, um, and that is, again, you know, when you look at, at the way the Saudis want to move forward, in, in the 1950s, of course, uh, all of the political activity was inside the family. We used to refer to it as the black box of, of Saudi decision making. Um, it is still today, uh, in fact, in some ways, it's even more of a black box inside of the Saudi decision making uh, uh, circle than it was, say, 10 or 20 years ago. Um, you know, in terms of this process of evolution that uh, Mohammed bin Salman is, is pushing, 
To what extent do you think that 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 can go forward without the kind of political opening uh, that uh, that would give people more of a say in the direction of society, that would create the institutions that allow citizens to play a more active role in the decision making as well as in the economics and the and the social issues. Well. On a certain level that's somewhere above the superficial, but not entirely substantive, the institutions that allow people to participate in decision making already exist in the sense that the consultative assembly really has a role. You have uh, municipal councils to which women, for which women can run as candidates and in which they can vote. Um, and you might argue that those are essentially window dressing um, you have the national dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. It was so typical. We're going to have the national dialogue, which everybody will talk to everybody. And the first thing they did was create an enormous building and staff it with government employees. <laughs> right? I mean, it's just so typical of Saudi Arabia. That's their idea of dealing with the situation. Um, but I'm going to answer that question with a question. Next year, or the year after that, or soon, life being what it is, the king is going to die. And Mohammed bin Salman has become the king of Saudi Arabia. Tell me who's going to be his crown prince. I have read a couple of stories, mostly from dissidents who don't live in Saudi Arabia, but that his plan is to appoint his son, right. age nine, last I heard, right. as crown prince. It, to you and me, that would be the point at which the rest of the family would have to say, no, 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 we're not doing that, right? We're not going to be in that, we're not going to be in that position. But I don't know. You that know, idea has been out there actually for, for a few years that, that the intent was uh, to, to eliminate this kind of horizontal succession and make it a vertical succession, a succession, succession within the, the kind of Bani Salman. Uh, maybe with with the full brothers families as well, so it would be you know kind of a Sudari. Sure, fine. But if you have if you have a forty year old crown prince who's a world traveler, an experienced diplomat, and has an advanced degree from Oxford, fine. But if you have a child, I don't think that's going to work. I want to add say one last thing about the book. Right? One last tidbit I want to throw <laughs> out there to entice you to read it. Right? The CIA didn't want to use its own agents to squeeze the king. So they hired an outsider, a gentleman named Robert Mayhew. Now some of you may remember him. He was best known as the operator of Howard Hughes's Las Vegas casinos, right? Um, but he was also the CIA's go-between in trying to get the mob to assassinate Castro. He was the guy who went to, and negotiate with Johnny Roselli on behalf of the CIA. He was the CIA's agent in the Onassis case. So if you want to find out what he did, I'll be glad to, <laughs> I'll be glad to tell you in print form. On that note, on that note, I think that's all we have time for today. But Tom, I, I do want to thank you for coming in and uh, uh, spending this time with us. Uh, do encourage and you're going to be uh, uh, back there selling, selling books and signing them. Uh, and uh, I finished reading it uh, uh, over the weekend, and it's, uh, it's, it's a jolly good read, as they say. So, <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate it. Thank you all for being here.